I did worry about this one because this is kind of like a, a super panel of the super grown-ups. So I would love to welcome Dr. Eloise Epstein back up to the stage, Drashko Yelovich, Sam Matrafavari, and Mark Webb and Daniel Bernal, please. Yeah, we're going to be sharing microphones. So the, the fun bit, we're going to be playing past the mic, and off we go. Daniel, good to see you. Um, okay. Everyone looks terrified. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic. Right, welcome. Look, before we get going at all, let's just do some quick introductions. Eloise, if you don't mind, we're going to skip you. Yep. Drashko, we're going to skip you. Sam, please. Sam Achambok. I'm the Regional Director for the Middle East and North Africa for SIPS, the Chartered Institute of Procurement and Supply. Mark Webb, Managing Director of Future Purchasing. Daniel Banning, the CPO of Atlantic Group, uh, a creation-based FMCG company. Wonderful. And keep that microphone, Daniel, because we're going to start the first question with you, because otherwise <laughs> we're going to come all the way back here. Okay. We've just covered, in a, in a very light opening speech, nuclear war, AI and the fact that category management is all over, which is great. Uh, uh, what I just want to do is just touch base because the word digital, before we even get to AI, I reckon if I did a quick survey of everyone here about what you think digital is, I'd end up with as many different answers as we've got in the room. So what I just want to do is just set the scene and perhaps you could just, and I'm going to come to everyone, just share what digital means to you in, in your working environment. Wow. <laughs> um, first of all, um, I'm a foodstuff engineer, so very far from being a technological geek. So my vision of this will be, how to say, uh, very far from being someone from inside this, this branch. So in a, in a basic way, I would consider digital as the electronic technology that helps collecting, cleansing, and processing the data related to your, cat your categories, your suppliers, your markets, and your competition. Okay. In a little bit more advanced way, I see digital procurement as some superpower algorithm that really helps you giving the solution to the business needs and requirements to ha that you have to support. So that would be my vision of, of digital. Well, there we go. Mark, follow that if you can. Well, very simply, I think uh, it's about what we used to do in PowerPoint, uh, and I've been doing it for 25 years in my case in PowerPoint, doing it in a digital platform. Uh, and also, you know, sometimes it isn't doing it even in PowerPoint, it's doing it in 100-page Word documents I've seen people come up with that are very static, and also Excel, which is absolutely something you could never show to a stakeholder. Got it. So. Sam, thank you. You've got a unique perspective from SIPs, you see a lot. What does it mean to you? Well, they said everything, but um, <laughs> is there anything left? I think, look, digital is technology, it's a, it's a tool, it's an enabler, it's something. Um, it, it, it's a tool that really gives you, allows us to have more efficiency in procurement and supply, more agility in procurement and supply, um, and also innovation of thought, because actually what it's supposed to do here is, is the machine, let's call it the machine, is supposed to be there to do all the crunching for you and give the humans the opportunity to, to be a lot more strategic. So that's really what it's there for, as far as I, I'm concerned. I think the, the point about PowerPoint is, is an interesting one, because um, just imagine, I don't know how old everyone here is, but just imagine what you'd have to do to create a presentation um, similar to a PowerPoint presentation now, years ago before PowerPoint was, was created. You'll need to be very advanced in digital design. Those kind of slides will have to be created by someone else, but now any um, amateur can, 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 can do a PowerPoint presentation. So that's really what technology is supposed to do. It's supposed to take away that heavy lifting uh, and for us to be able to use our brains uh, to be strategic. Uh, Drashko, I'm, uh, just as a last take, I mean, you build digital solutions, so I mean, actually, what does digital mean to you? And I'm going to skip it. Yes, I think it's a perfectly described by the colleagues. Uh, I'm probably biased as building it. 
and uh, my first association when you asked the question was the Tsirto history, how we started, and even longer with Carney, you know, I can imagine putting the, the plastic foils on, the, on, on that stuff, you know, that projector. That was the first day I, I joined Carney, so I had to print the stuff, you know. And then, then we introduced actually the, the laptops and the PowerPoint and so on. And when I started um, as a Cirto, I actually started also using the templates, PowerPoint templates and um, Excel, and we digitized it over time. So at the beginning, we actually translated the methodology, which was uh, designed in, um, and translated into the PowerPoint and Excel. We started translating it into a digital format. And then later on, we improved. So someone mentioned it's constant improvement of the digital. It's a constant innovation, you know. So then we added some intelligence to that. Now we are experimenting with ChatGPT and so on. So there is a digital way forward, and I can see all the benefits out of it. Okay, I, I'm, I, at this point, I'm going to have to do a straw poll just to establish the age ranges in the <laughs> audience. Um, who has used an overhead projector to do a presentation? Uh, and there's people looking mystified at the back of the room. Uh, for what it's worth, if you want to know the opposite of digital, it was university, my professor writing live, and this was technology, in the, in, the, in the 80s, writing his notes live on an overhead projector, which he then photocopied to give us the notes. Two problems, non-waterproof marker, and he sneezed. <laughs> I'll let you imagine. The thing is, the reason I raise that is because that's 30 years ago, and as you've just pointed out, in 15 years, we've not only gone from an overhead projector to PowerPoint, we've gone from PowerPoint to an AI predicting answers based on human questions. That's a hockey stick in anyone's book. And Sam, if I may, I'm gonna come back to you now, because, I, because you're sort of uniquely placed in both region and with SIPs. We've always had this focus, it's terrible on cost reduction and spend and blah, blah, blah. But actually, the world isn't like that anymore. We are all dealing with a whole set of different concepts of value. ESG, societal, social, you name it. From what you've seen, is digital helping to make that easier? Or are we literally about to get washed over by a tidal wave of information? Um. Interesting question. Digital is about to help us do that. Um, I think it's a little bit early to say universally uh, that digital is, but the potential is absolutely there. I think what digital should be able to do is allow us to articulate to our stakeholders internally and externally what we're doing and what value is. Because the race to the bottom means that value is always going to be the lowest, cheapest price, unless we can say otherwise. Uh, do we have time to do the relevant analysis and articulation uh, to be able to sell the, the, the innate value to our stakeholders who are looking for um, you know, value at the, bo to the in, you know, on the bottom line? So I think that's what digital is starting to do, starting to enable us to have a system, have a tool that can give us the data to articulate to those stakeholders to say, this is what value is and this is why it is, in a way that we probably couldn't do um, in, in any kind of speed previously. So I'm seeing that um, you know, certainly across the world. If I focus on the Middle East where I'm based, there's a big divide between the outliers, the people who are really um, engaged in, in digital technologies in a big way, and, and those who are still at a very uh, basic level of procurement, not, not only digital. Uh, but I can see certainly once the maturity gap is closed, the potential is, is endless. Uh, and Mark, what's your, I mean, again, you have a broad view, so what do you observe? Yeah, I think one good thing with a digital platform is it forces people down a particular route. Um, and the, the PowerPoint example, uh, we've had lots of clients where you'd review the strategy and you go back to your point about the broad range of value or business requirements, people would delete the page out. And you go, well, where's that page? It's fundamental to it. What are we actually requiring as an outcome? People go, that's a bit odd, that bit. And so they deleted it out. And I've had this numerous times. Or it's written in such a poor way that you go, I could write that. I know nothing about the category, satellites, or something I was looking at recently. And you go, 
but there's nothing in there that you know the, the general person couldn't put together. So I think the the questioning style uh, that's in certainly in the Sergio platform drives a more consistent uh, quality threshold that is hard to drive. And you know you spend a lot of time coaching people to get these business requirements and the value levers right. And I think this this is going to allow more people to achieve a better standard. And, and Daniel, just sort of building on that, I mean, what's been your experience of investment in digital? Has it, like many companies, started with you or very much, how can it help us reduce cost? Or are you beginning to see a broadening of digital solutions into other value drivers that are outside pure money? Yeah, <clears throat> so maybe first to start with the definition of the value. I think as... I mean, we in procurement are mostly defined as a, as a service, which means that we have our clients, right? So we should ask our clients how we are bringing, let's say, value to them. And probably the answer would be, we would have as many answers as, as the people that we ask. Uh, for someone in, in marketing, probably that would be the innovation. For, for R&D, that would be the quality. For finance, that would be the, the lowest cost. So, paradoxically, we have to balance between various requirements that are put on, on procurement and sometimes to prioritize it according to our own vision, let's say, or, or assessment. And now coming back to, to, to our, let's say, digital journey, we also started 15 or 20 years ago with the PowerPoints. At that time, we consider this as a high tech, right? <laughs> Later on, probably we jump on this uh, uh, wagon by really identifying what would be the most advanced, let's say, technology that would drive us further, right? So fortunately, at that time, we, we recognize Sirto as, as, as a good platform, let's say, for, uh, for, for digital, digitaliz digitalizing uh, our procurement and, and, and hopefully we, we did not make mistake on that. So today I would say that we are not talking about isolated technologies. We are talking about the end-to-end -end, end -end suite, which is really helping us to manage procurement in a, in a holistic way. And, and at the same time, to balance the various needs and requirements coming from the various parts of the business. This is how we see the digital in procurement today. And Eloise, if I may, if I link that back to your point about human experience. I think as Daniel said out, there are different stakeholders that have different priorities and in the competition for whose value is the most valuable, are you seeing digital playing a role in settling that or do you think that's just gonna continue to be a relationship-based decision? I mean, what's your feeling? I think it, it actually can help that, right. but we're not, it's an enabler, but we're not using it effectively enough. And yeah. so we have the power to influence, and the business and procurement still are mile, kilometers apart. <laughs> and, um, and we're nowhere near where we need to be. And if you're gonna influence the business, we now have the data to actually bring that to bear. And right. I don't think we've effectively, a few folks have, but not nearly what we need to do. And I guess just sort of full circle then. I mean, you, Sergio, like everything focused initially on the delivery of that key value, cost reduction, but you, you know, Sergio itself has been on a journey to try to recognize other values. Sustainability has been a big push for you and it's broadening. What's your observation in what clients are asking you for and how easy it is then to offer them something that actually meets that that ability to look at different sources of value well sure i think that uh, especially in our last developments and last thinking we put uh, business requirements as daniel mentioned uh, in the center of everything you know so uh, category managers often tend to overanalyze and make the market analysis and this and that, but actually the, the key point is understanding who the stakeholders are and what are their business requirements. Uh, you are, many of you are familiar with Raxi and so on, so there are a few more added in the last couple of years. 
So um, our take is that we need to more strongly support uh, business requirements to make it happen in a digital way, contextualized, to make the strategy and the value relevant for the business. A little bit of a, of a left field question, and it actually picks up on something we, we were discussing before the panel. The impact of digital inequality. I promised I wouldn't show a Terminator slide. You showed a Terminator slide. But actually, just again, unscientific straw poll, who's worried that your lack of progress in digital solutions is going to put your business at a disadvantage? with either suppliers or clients that are more digitized. Is anyone worried about that? Everyone's confident. Who would play chess against a chess computer and think they were going to win? Brother, OK. Yeah, yeah, OK. We wouldn't. I mean, I'm just interested, just as a quick aside, I mean, Mark, I'm going to, if I may, Come to you, but I mean, what, what, what do you? Is there a risk that as we make this leap, not just the last 15 years from folders to AI, that as, as Sam said, different companies charge ahead, other companies are left behind. That there's some kind of inequality that actually might introduce a risk. Yeah, I think it's uh, real, realistic that you know there's only five percent in the research that we do of organisations that have this stuff really well nailed, right. um, and there's seventy five percent of a large rump of organisations, both private and public, that don't. So I, I definitely think that what's going to happen is those that use it are going to go even further forward and leave a whole rump of people, uh, organisations that don't do category management particularly well, and that is definitely you know the value outcomes that we see. You get good at category management, you get better value outcomes. We can see the direct correlation. Right. Uh, anyways, if I may, I'm going to bring this back to you. But I mean, across your research, is this different pace of progress going to mean that the slow ones catch up, or that actually we've got a problem in there's going to be like an elite 10% that are doing great trading and everyone else is just Okay. Well, we, I, I make a couple of points. One, digital adoption has this, like, like Mark said, a really a different ado pace of adoption, and that's yeah. a real problem. But I'd also say, I, I'd say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something that I think you'll find funny. Blockchain. Like, where did blockchain go? And it, it went nowhere because it's reliant on digital competency of your suppliers. So I do think no matter how fast you charge forward, there is a certain, you can be held back by di digital illiteracy. And I also would say the other thing that in my research that I see is that leaders don't understand digital. In fact, in my new book, I have some really great examples of leaders not understanding the technology. So it's leaders holding the organization, or the juniors right. in the organization holding it back. And Jessica, I know this, uh, this has actually been a topic that I know you've addressed with some clients, where clients have said, look, it's great, we can do category management, but our suppliers can't, so how are we going to extend what we do to bring you know, our suppliers into that orbit? I mean, do you see that as the direction of travel for search? It's, a broad, it's not just an ecosystem of tools, but actually it's an ecosystem of you, your suppliers, your clients who collaborate in category management. Is, do you think that's the future? Yes, we have an example. We started already doing that um, effort and the uh, client was actually very successful in implementation so we suggested to roll that out uh, to, uh, to suppliers. And there is a good response so far because they are also interested and they say, okay, if client does it, we should do it as well because we yeah. don't want client to have a ad um, competitive advantage, you know. And right. That's expected, maybe in future even regulated, you know. And maybe just get back to the question if the top 10% will be more successful than the, than the others. We see a certain risk that uh, big companies are much faster, are more willing to invest, have more appetite, have better stuff, you know. So we assert, see a certain risk that there will be uh, leaders and also many leggers, you know. There is a certain risk of technology adoption in uh, general. Got it. Uh, and Sam, you made the point that regionally, you're seeing a real discrepancy. Are, are you seeing that impacting the way people operate or creating an unfair playing field, if you like? Um, 
this one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, in a way, yes, but in a way, no, because I think okay. technology relies heavily on widespread adoption anyway. Okay, so all stakeholders in the ecosystem need to be on board. Otherwise, even if you are a big company and you have access to technology, um, if your suppliers are not on board, if other stakeholders are not on board, then, then your effectiveness is less. You may be missing out on working with suppliers who don't have access to it, for example. So, so I'm not seeing it yet. I think that the bigger adopters are getting a bit of a, an advantage over others at the moment, reputationally. Uh, but, but our research hasn't showed that um, efficiency alone is directly adding to the bottom line yet. Um, because I think one thing that, there's one thing that technology does in terms of human beings, it, it, it raises the, let's call it the intellectual entry point to a particular thing, to procurement as it is. Uh, and I always say, look, years ago, if, if I didn't do very well in school, I could get a job in McDonald's. Okay? But if all McDonald's stores now are automated and you can have just walk right. in and press a button, then actually, McDonald's only employs people who have a certain intelligence. So, it's you know procurement is raising the intellectual entry point. The the guys who push buttons or open envelopes are, are less valuable now, and are probably gonna gonna um, uh, be out of the game. So the efficiency is with the people who are adopting technology now. Right. The others will catch up, um, and but it takes full adoption uh, to see the full effect uh, across all stakeholder groups. Well, perfect. And Daniel, if I may, I'm going to come to you for just the last question, just quickly. You're unique on this panel because you actually run a procurement team. Digital AI as it comes in, what's your sense of what your team might look like in the future if even half the promise of digital and AI come in? Are you going to have the same people working quicker or is it going to be completely different. What's your, what's, or what are your thoughts on it? Well, so first question is whether there will be a team needed, right? Um, well, first I was, I was very afraid when I saw the title of Eloise's presentation, uh, thinking to myself, oh Daniel, so your job is over very soon. I mean, who will, who will, who will be interested in, in paying you high money because there, there are already machines who are already, who are almost cheap, right? Who, who are almost costless. But then with, with this presentation, I got a, a, a little bit more uh, optimism than at the beginning because there are still humans behind that. I mean, you can get as many scenarios from the algorithms, from the machines, and it's excellent because otherwise people will probably uh, fill in the Excel sheets for days or for months to get, let's say, to collect those data, to, 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 to classify the data, to process them, and then to make scenarios. So now you can get scenarios just like this, but at the end of the day, decision will be on, on humans, right? So as long as the procurement profession is based on relationship, and I cannot imagine that it will be differently in the future, I think that at least one human should be behind this profession. Maybe we won't need, there won't be a need for a large teams. Maybe there will be, a, 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 I don't know, a, a one, one procurement professional and many IT guys, many, uh, many people with the, uh, uh, soft skills who can really establish and maintain good relationship. Yeah. So the profile of the procurement staff will be definitely different from the current one, but there will be someone who will work in procurement or however we are going to call this profession in the future. So I don't think that this is the end of profession. Of course, it will look probably like, it will look very differently from how it looks right now, but there is, there is, uh, uh, there is good reason to be optimistic about it. So let's embrace the technology, let's use it for a good and then let's, of course, be proud of that. So instead of being laggards, instead of being afraid, really, let's be the first who will embrace advanced technologies. And I'm not going to extend the question because the nods are unanimous. So instead, I'm going to ask you one final question, a little one thing 
you know, if you were advising anybody in the audience here who was actually about to embark on that transformative journey to digitization, increasingly to AI, to bring the benefits, not just to category management, maybe into our associated disciplines, SRM, risk, whatever, what would be the one piece of advice that you would give a procurement leader if they were going to make sure that digital transformation were in the context of what digital is now, what would be your advice that people should focus on? Uh, maybe it's all wrapped into one, but it's go faster, be fearless, and, and yeah, I, I'd say go faster and be fearless. Trashka, what do you think? Well, I'm always coming back to business requirements. I can't help myself. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, of course, you need to first know the strategy of a company, which is coming from the business requirement. And knowing strategy, you know your organization. And knowing your potential future organization, you actually know how the digital journey should look like. Right. Simple as that. So. Um, I, would, I would say, look, be open-minded to embrace change. Uh, I think a lot of people are talking about, should we adopt this or should we adopt that? But I don't think that's our question to answer. Um, it's, if we look at the next, all the generation that's coming up right now, they have a huge adoption of innovative concepts. And I remember we had a bring your child to work day the other day um, in the office. And um, uh, one of my team brought his 12-year-old son to sit in on a team meeting. And the kid was observing the team meeting. And, and afterwards, I had a one-to-one -one with him. And I said, so, have you got any questions about what you've observed today? Um, and he said, yeah, great, great, great session. But the only question I've got to ask is, what is an invoice? So, <laughs> sorry, so I'm thinking, you know, this 12-year-old kid doesn't really know what an invoice is. So I'm just about to explain everything to him. It's, you know, what happens is you get someone into the job for, for you, and then you do the job, and they send you a piece of paper, and then you validate that paper, then you pass. And as I was going through it, I realized how ridiculous it is. You know, what is an invoice? Why, why do we have this? And why are we going to, you know, fill the brains of young kids to understand this whole process of, purchase, requisition, invoice. They're not interested. Okay? They, they shouldn't actually populate their brain um, with, <laughs> with this, and they're not going to. You know, smart contracts, whatever we want to call them. But the, the innovation is there, so it's not down to us to adopt. We just need to be smart to adopt, but if we don't, because they're going to happen anyway. Perfect. Well, yeah, I think... Oh. Try this one. Um, yeah, I think... Getting alignment across the leadership team is really key in an organization because often they don't have a common view of what good is. Uh, and that makes it very difficult to drive a change like we're talking about when uh, you haven't got the same message being communicated down. Uh, so that would be my, my two path. Daniel. So if you are thinking of implementing some technology in your procurement process or in your procurement organization, then my advice would be, first, think of the purpose that you wish to accomplish or, that, or the, the, the issue or the challenge that you wish to resolve with the technology. Don't do it because of just having the fear of missing out. So that would be the, the, the worst po uh, possible approach. So first, the purpose, then select the technology, and that would be the perfect match. I can't think of a better way to close. Ladies and gentlemen, Thank you very much for your contribution.